it allows you to specify, hey, this proposal is to sell ETH for USDC. And these are the people that can execute that proposal. And you can also specify some guardrails around it, but it basically allows you to create a proposal that instead of having very explicit arbitrary by code that it will execute, that is um, generated at the proposal creation time, it allows you the proposal just to kind of specify the intent of wanting to trade ETH for USDC and also setting addresses of, a, of people within the party that you trust to execute that proposal um, once it's accepted. So that allows you to create the trade, pass the trade, and then have the actual execution of the trade use bytecode at the time of execution. On this episode, we are talking with Steve from PartyDAO, who is an incredible builder in the space. Yeah, super cool conversation. We got to talk a little bit about uh, design patterns in Web3 uh, around mutability. We talked a little bit about the um, just the evolution of the space over time. Uh, Chase, what else did you pull from this? Yeah, I think I think we talked quite a bit about, you know, the best design patterns for building for consumer crypto, which is really interesting. And then also, I think more broadly, what it looks like to build generalized protocols, but for niche users, which was really an interesting um, take from Steve. So this was a great episode and hopefully you enjoyed as much as we enjoyed recording it. We are here with Steve Klebanoff, who is the tech lead at PartyDAO. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Happy to be here. I cannot wait to dive in to all of the things that you've been working on at PartyDAO um, and some of the cool stuff that you've worked on over the last few years in crypto in general. But maybe before we do that, you can give a little bit of context on you, what got you into crypto, all of all of that. Yeah, happy to. So I got into kind of the Ethereum ecosystem in late 2016. First is just a curiosity of like, what is this strange asset and technology that people are talking about uh, on Reddit? It was um, kind of got into it as a speculative investment at first, but then started digging into the technology that was underneath the hood of that speculative investment, as well as like what were actually the novel things you could do with that technology um, at the time. So. My primary use case for using crypto um, in kind of late 2016, early 2017 was just trading coins. Um, and I had some real problems with the centralized exchanges that I was using at the time in order to get access to kind of like the weird shit coins I was interested in. I often had to register for these weird offshore websites where I wasn't sure if they were going to rug me. Um, and when I was digging into Ethereum, I saw that there were these early decentralized exchanges that were coming out. One of the big ones at the time was Ether Delta. Um, so I started seeing some real benefits to these decentralized exchanges, um, knowing that I could self custody my funds, knowing that I could trade whatever token I wanted. Um, and I didn't need to worry about some sort of centralized server uh, rugging me. I just had to worry about the risks at the smart contract layer or even like using a malicious front end. So kind of trading off one risk for another, but I was like really intrigued with this technology that felt pretty novel and kind of solved real problems for myself, at least when it came to shitcoin trading trading. So um I started trading on those early DEXs. I started arbitraging centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges um as kind of like a side project to make some money and just became really obsessed with the the core technology un, under the hood this kind of like distributed uh computing machine that i could could interact with permissionlessly and also was really excited about the idea of every api kind of being open by default on the ethereum ecosystem coming from the like web 2 software as a service world dealing with a bunch of really crappy api providers. Um, it was really empowering and freeing to kind of see that every smart contract was open to interact with without any permissioning. So that got me really excited. And it also had me interacting with the zero X smart contracts eventually to do some of that arbitrage. And eventually I saw that they were hiring and that they didn't require kind of like hardcore previous crypto experience. So I applied and enjoyed them in 2018. And that kind of started my full-time uh, crypto adventure. 
Yeah, I definitely want to dive into how you got from zero X all the way to Party Dow. But even before we do that, um, for people who aren't familiar with with what you're working on at zero X, it's kind of interesting now with Uniswap X because there are actually some like interesting similarities. So maybe you can give just a little bit of an overview on what you're working on there. Yeah, so I did a lot of different things at zero X, but I would say the bulk of my time was spent on what we called uh, the maker team, which was focused on market making on zero X, both supporting external market makers that were market making on the system, as well as doing some market making internally at zero X as well. Um, so we did a lot of kind of like research, investigation and development to empower market makers uh, to use the zero X uh, protocol in order to provide like the the best pricing and best experience for users, as well as like making market makers kind of like comfortable um, and happy with uh, how they could place and execute the the orders that they were offering. So we saw that the there were a lot of different models at the time. There was kind of the Uniswap V2 AMM model. There was a 0x um, kind of off-chain order book, on-chain uh, settlement model. Uh, we did we had some really awesome uh, data folks on the team as well that did a lot of investigation around the different types of models and where volume was flowing, et cetera. And we did a lot of in-depth kind of conversations, research and experimentation to kind of see what might be uh, ways in which we could improve market making uh, in the ecosystem. And ultimately, what I ended up working on and what we landed on that ended up being pretty successful was developing a request for quote system for Zero X. So primarily before that, the primary way in which people would interact with Zero X was through the open order book model where, you know, you're posting orders on an open order book and anybody can fill them. And the the people that fill them could be retail users using a front end. They could be uh, programmatic bots that are kind of interacting with the API, um, but still just kind of like storing a private key in some Node.js server somewhere, or they could be atomic arbitrage bots kind of doing MEV stuff where they're taking advantage of a price discrepancy between one decentralized exchange and another decentralized exchange. And when we really got into investigating market making, we recognized that often market makers, if they kind of knew the the counterparty that they were interacting with, they could potentially provide better pricing or even different types of orders if they had strong guarantees about who they were interacting with. So they might, if somebody is going to get liquidated on their like MakerDAO loan, for example, they might just care about having an order with the longest possible expiration time because they just want to avoid the transaction reverting on chain. Um, and they just kind of want to guarantee that they will be able to execute that order. So that's kind of a different profile of order of kind of like a atomic arbitrage bot that cares about the best possible pricing, but it could be a really short expiration time um because they're going to submit with like a really high gas price or like um through like the mev like on optimized rpc endpoint right so we developed this request for quote system that basically allowed people to use our api to request a quote and they would provide what their ethereum address is and there would also be an api key associated with what uh like platform or protocol that they were using so you would uh, basically the market makers would understand is this a retail user coming through from Macho who's using like a regular EOA to trade? Or is this atomic arbitrage bot that's trying to take advantage of some price discrepancy who I'm trading with? Or is this DeFi saver who's trying to save somebody from a liquidation? And by being able to sign an order just for that particular um, user, it allowed them to provide like the best pricing for that particular uh, user characteristic and have more kind of control over their order flow, but also offer kind of better orders that are better, better suited for the person who's trying to trade. Um, so that's what I spent a lot of my time working on. That feels particularly interesting in the context of like, so you went from zero X where you're really building sort of deep, like deeper infrastructure that then people build on top of and build front ends around. And, and to your point around like different types of users, you have very different types of activity. Um, I'm curious how you shifted from that towards um, some of the projects that you did with like the Bronx Zoo and the Rats project and Solvency. Maybe you can touch sort of touch on each of those projects, but that feels like a very different type of project. So I'm curious how you transitioned there. Yeah, definitely. So as much as I enjoyed working at Zero X, um, I felt like I was surrounded by like giga brains that were just like even deeper in the tech than I was. They like kind of like got kicks off like 
weird ass solidity optimizations and kind of this hardcore kind of like backend infrastructure. And uh, I respect them a lot, but I also like recognize that I, I recognize that I was not it's built the same way as them in, in that, like, as much as I love kind of like the deep tech and like the trade execution, et cetera, I also like really appreciate cultural like elements and community coordination and thinking about kind of like game theory, not just at like a trade execution uh, level, but also like on a social coordination level. And really I've always had like a longstanding appreciation for like fringe culture in kind of like, uh, mostly in music, uh, but somewhat in art as well. So when I got introduced to the NFT ecosystem, um, I really felt like that was a place where I, so like had a, a unique edge in which like I could dive into the technical details of some of the hardcore stuff, but not get as crazy about it as some of these other, uh, giga brains in the ecosystem, but also had like a pretty good sense of like the cultural elements and like artistic elements and how to interface with people, whether that be like artists, like musicians, community members, DAO members, um, as well as with technical folks and kind of my unique edge was being able to bring that all together from the technical implementation, technical implementation to the community aspect, um, into like the cultural, um, kind of like cultural context as well. So that's mm. what kind of like inspired me to dive deeper into the NFT ecosystem, eventually leave zero X and focus on kind of, uh, take a sabbatical to really focus on creative pursuits. And that's where, uh, some of the projects that you mentioned, um, came out of. So, uh, just briefly touching on some of the projects that I did, uh, solvency was a generative art NFT project in collaboration with my friend, uh, Ezra Miller, in which we took the technology that was really only available at art blocks at the time and made our own implementation of it to free ourselves of some of the limitations um that were on it to develop like one of the first bespoke um generative art nft projects like done by an independent developer as opposed to a platform um and that was a really fun and exciting project that kind of hit on a lot of those elements that i was speaking to that i want to explore during that sabbatical time um I also developed in collaboration with uh, this guy, Jay DeLay, uh, who's kind of like very into this like trash art NFT uh, scene, this project called Rats, which allowed people to trade artwork uh, for artwork, which was a just fun experiment of what happens when you pair like a smart contract engineer with an artist to kind of put out a novel experiment um, on chain. And then I also, uh, as part of actually a Zero X hackathon, worked on this project called Zoo Token, which was like the first fractionalized uh, metaverse parcel uh, put on chain where we bought a piece of land in crypto voxels uh, in the Bronx neighborhood. And we had my buddy Ogar build uh, like a really epic zoo build on that virtual piece of land. And then we put it into a smart contract, issued ERC-20 uh, tokens um, out of that smart contract, allowed people to govern the land and eventually had the land sell through a Dutch auction and people got to split the proceeds. So this is just kind of, you can see like a suite of like creative endeavors to really explore, like what is that mashup of kind of like taking advantage of the unique aspects of the EVM, but pairing that uh, with some just like cultural and like uh, cultural references and collaborations with artists that are doing interesting things. Yeah, I'd be curious from, you know, a uh, uh, perspective of how you approach like software architecture and designing smart contracts. What is sort of the the difference between how you approach something like 0x where you have this like deeper level protocol versus something that's one of these more like creative endeavor uh, sort of exploration type projects? Yeah, I mean, I think at 0x, I was actually largely just focused on kind of like backend um, interaction. So I really interfaced with the Solidity a lot and collaborated with the Solidity engineers, but I wasn't the one actually writing the Solidity. I was focusing more on like, how do we make the Solidity as easy as possible to interact with for kind of like market makers and external participants. So even, you know, while at 0x, I've always kind of been focused on, okay, it's great if you have awesome Solidity, but it can really be a hindrance if that solidity is really challenging to interact with uh for external developers and in doing that 
you have to think about what does it mean for an external developer to interact with your Solidity? You can have other smart contracts that inter interact with your Solidity. You can develop like a bespoke TypeScript uh, API, but not everybody uses TypeScript and a lot of market makers kind of use other uh, languages um, as well. So, um, I, and at now at PartyDAO being kind of a tech lead and focusing a lot on the full stack engineering, that continues to be something that I have to think about a lot. Um, and I do think that that is a unique role that a lot more people in the ecosystem should be focusing on is focusing on engineering efforts that kind of help bridge the solidity engineering work as well as the full stack engineering work and help think about how can we ensure that the solidity that's developed is really easy to interact with um, for other engineers, whether that's other smart contracts or other full stack engineers or pe and people interacting with it, regardless of what programming language they're using and if you have an official API. So when I think about zero X engineering and even party DAO engineering, I'm thinking largely about uh, composability for external developers, but also for our own internal front end team. Uh, but when it comes to these more creative endeavors, they are more just experiments, exploratory, and don't really need to lean into composability or kind of being like a long lasting project with a lot of um, kind of integration. So in a way, it's kind of like simpler um, and allows for more uh, like creativity and exploration because you don't kind of have some of those same constraints. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and I definitely want to dig into some of the pieces around how you design for um, party DAO products needing to be uh, you know, interoperable, I guess is kind of the wrong word, but composable and, and be able to interact with lots of other types of contracts. But maybe before we dive into into that, you can give a high level overview of Party DAO and most recently Party Protocol, which I'm very excited to chat about. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot to uh, unpack there. I'll say, I think before I get into the details of the Party Protocol, it's kind of helpful to understand the origin story of uh, Party DAO, which I think is a unique one and is kind of like um, embedded in kind of how, how we approach things. So the part, Party DAO was started just by a tweet from Dennis from Mirror, uh, you know, tweeting something like, it's Friday night, let's design a protocol mechanism together on Twitter. And people started just jamming I on ideas. And at the time, these NFT auctions were really popping off. They were doing a lot of volume. They were getting a lot of attention, but it was always whale versus whale kind of like uh, competing to buy these high priced NFTs. So uh, people started jamming and exploring uh, what would it be like to allow people to pool their capital together to compete in these NFT auctions. And Anish, uh, who's a really talented uh, developer, built a really quick proof of concept over the weekend even used it on mainnet and that really showed like, okay, in a relatively short amount of time, you can build a mechanism to like achieve this group coordination of bidding in these NFT auctions. So then a, a relatively small mirror crowdfund was started to create what was like the first incarnation of party DAO. So, uh, people, we raised ETH. It was like, I think a hundred thousand dollars at the time to basically take a niche's, um, prototype and actually bring it to um, like a mainnet version that like consumers could use. So iterating on the protocol, iterating on the solidity, developing um, a front end. Um, and I was responsible for helping out with that along with like a other few Epic um, contributors over the course of three months where we basically in our spare time uh, put together the first version of a party bid, which allowed people to pool their capital together bid in NFT auctions. And then once the NFT auction was won, you got proportional ERC 20s that represented your ownership of that NFT. And we integrated with um, the fractional dot art, like the V1 of their protocol at the time to kind of deal with the governance and kind of like management out of the NFT after the purchase. So we really focused on just that first phase of pooling capital, bid in NFT, uh, bidding on the NFT, winning the NFT, and then we deferred the governance um, and all the kind of like reselling of the NFT to fractional.art. So that was how like Party DAO as an organization was created. And part that's how Party Bid, our first product, kind of came to fruition. Yeah, before we jump into Party Protocol, I can definitely see this through line where you 
gravitated toward finding what is newly possible with this technology. You go from like, um, you know, order book style um, market making to a more interesting fractionalizing uh, like NFT digital spaces to this like um, peer to peer art port trading portal and this like generative art. Um, and now this like protocol for group coordination around um, purchasing NFTs and, and items that might not otherwise be purchasable by the individual contributors within a given party. So um, what would you say sparked the excitement around just like digging really, really deep into this group coordination uh, niche within crypto? Yeah, again, I think it comes back to some of my like unique skill set. I feel like I'm trying to put together like culture, like art, as well as like deep technical um, like skills together to make something unique. And that's where I feel like I found the most like exciting parts of my like career unfold. Um, and I think it's kind of rooted in just wanting to see what can we do with this new technology that we have of composable smart contracts, like permissionless, um, like EVM interactions that just couldn't be done before in the, uh, like, like prior to that. So in the same way, when I saw art blocks for the first time, it was really interesting to me because prior to art blocks, a lot of the NFTs that you were seeing were just taking like a JPEG putting it on chain and then being able to trade it. And while there's some really unique characteristics to that, it didn't feel like it was taking advantage of some like new technology that could do things that weren't even possible, like in the real world before in that, you know, like you could make art, you could trade it with somebody granted you couldn't, you know, do it in a permissionless uh, way on like a permanent blockchain, et cetera, but still just kind of JPEG trading felt just like very inadequate, uh, felt like an analog, like to what was happening in the real world, where on art blocks, generating the pseudo random hash on chain, minting a new piece that not even the artist knew exactly what it would look like until it was minted by the user. And the artwork that was generated, taking elements from on chain data, you know, like the gas price you use, what else is going on chain, um, et cetera, to seed that pseudo random hash was just like a net new innovation that wasn't possible without uh, like the Ethereum technology that we have. So in the same way, that kind of felt like a zero to one moment for me about like creating something net new um, that really kind of uses the blockchain as like the canvas to create something novel as opposed to just trying to recreate what exists in the traditional world. I feel the same way about the group coordination mechanisms that we have. So when I think about permissionlessly raising funds from people wherever they might be without having to ask permission from everybody, allowing people to govern funds on chain um, together uh, with like no centralized authority, having the ability to kind of like revoke them uh, that ability and allowing uh, creative projects to be creative, created from that technology is just really inspiring uh, to me. Yeah, I mean, on the note of like, I think that is makes a ton of sense and is something that uh, feels like we need more of is like net new types of types of activity that can happen on chain. Um, in, in the context of sort of like pulling from existing patterns in the real world and all that stuff, something that I think is interesting about party protocol, which I think we can dive into, um, is it feels like some of these are like new primitives or at least party protocol is building their own versions of primitives, um, which I'm curious about because it seems like going from party bid. So party bid was using fractional um, mm -hmm. on, on the back end. Basically, party protocol kind of replaces some of that, right? Yeah, it definitely does. We kind of transition from focusing purely on like the crowdfunding uh, mechanism and the purchasing mecha mechanism to, and then just like deferring the governance to another protocol. With the party protocol, we said we want to build from the ground up our own version of governance. So instead of deferring to fractional uh, for everything, instead of even just deferring to like the standard governor Bravo implementation for everything, we think there's still like a pretty expansive design space that needs to be explored on the governance layer. And we felt like we were uniquely 
poised to um, take a real stab at developing something in, important and long lasting there. So um, through getting some really talented Solidity engineers on board, combined with uh, some experienced full stack engineers, as well as like rooting ourselves and continuing to try as hard as we can within the constraints to develop a consumer friendly uh, product, but with really um, a focus on uh, like permanence and decentralization and immutable smart contracts uh, to create something really, really special there. And that's what kind of party protocol uh, is. That's, that's kind of what, what came from taking, taking the stab at writing our own governance framework from, from the ground up, taking inspiration from governor Bravo, taking inspiration from kind of like traditional ways that things are done in the real world through kind of like delegation and uh, voting while also uh, leveraging the composability of the like Ethereum smart contracts um, as well and leveraging other protocols as we as they make sense in in our system. Yeah, I definitely want to dive into the sort of paradigm of consumer applications that are immutable. And I also think it would be good to touch on like uniquely, you know, what makes some of the the party protocol governance stuff um, different and also creating your own new thing when there are lots of standards, I think is unique. So definitely want to dive into that. Before we do that, maybe you can give a broad strokes overview of just like party protocol, what it does and generally how it works. Yeah, definitely. So um, party protocol well, it, we we kind of a, we kind of took a gradual evolution to how we introduced the party protocol. So as I mentioned, like party bid was for buying um, NFT. It was for the crowdfunding, the purchase of NFTs, and defer and we deferred the governance. Um, and then we said, okay, we think we actually want to take our own kind of stab at developing our own governance uh, framework. But instead of going super broad uh, from the start, we said. Let's design a flexible, interesting governance framework that can be used to basically do anything, um, you know, like raising ETH and using it however you'd uh, like it to. But in order to make a consumer friendly, easy to understand experience as we like introduce this governance system for the first time, let's still tether it to managing an NFT or a group of NFTs together. So we said, okay, the first version of party protocol that we release will still be focused around managing NFTs together. So now instead of just focusing on the crowdfunding, we also focus on the governance, but the governance is very tied to managing um, an NFT or a group of NFTs if you do a floor sweep. So we kind of kind of gradually introduced this governance system, but for a very specific use case still, which is the, the group buying and managing of the NFT. The reason why we did that is that if you go straight to kind of like flexible governance system to do anything with, I think it can be really hard for consumers to understand, like, why would I use this? What are the different use cases? If you land on a website that is offering just flexible governance for anything, if you're like, oh, I could buy land in Wyoming together, or I could be running an NFT fund, or I could be like starting a project, it's kind of like overwhelming for the first iteration to really uh, like to get people to use the product and understand why they would use it. So that's why we focus it still on the targeted use case of, hey, I want to buy an NFT together. And we focused on making the best possible experience uh, for that with this flexible governance system um, underneath the hood. And then after we had like kind of some months of iterating on it and seeing the usage with NF, uh, still with just kind of managing an NFT purchase together, we then kind of took the rails off and still offer that ability, but now we're really excited about the new functionality that just allows you to raise ETH together and do anything with that ETH. Um, so those are kind of like the broad strokes of our approach of going from like super targeted use case, focusing just on crowdfund, expanding to governance, but still within the targeted use case, but then, exp then kind of taking the training wheels off. And now we allow anybody to do anything using our protocol. So. Those are kind of broad strokes about our approach. Um, and then I'm also happy to get into the details of actually how the protocol works, what are the different components and what might make it unique. Yeah, so I definitely want to dive into the components. And I guess just to like parrot that back, it sounds like 
I really like this approach, which is basically like go to market with a very specific, um, you know, product or or like niche that you're serving, but make the smart contracts generalized enough that they can also be applied to other things. Like taking the learnings from the very specific uh, use case to iterate on the protocol level. And then when it felt like it was the right time, kind of take the training wheels off and like allow people to see and use like the full flexibility of the product that was underneath the hood uh, for a while there, but just wasn't kind of like shown shown to the user. Um, and again, I think it's a really helpful go to market strategy to just be like, okay, I have a very specific use case. I have a very specific problem. This protocol solves that exact problem. And through allowing people to work within that constrained use case, building a flexible system that's possible for more use cases, and then kind of revealing that and giving that to the users um, when, uh, after kind of receiving a lot of learnings from that more specific use case. Yeah, I think about the things that I've seen in Web3 that have fascinated me the most. And it's like these uh, just like lightning in a bottle moments. Um, Pleaser DAO was one of them when a, a random group of strangers decided to pull money together to um, to buy the NFT and then like tr attempting to buy the Constitution, um, even though it didn't work out. It was the sort of like instantaneous global capital formation event that just happened overnight. And I think to your point, um, there's still so much uh, uh, paving the way to get from the sort of like janky user experience of people like messaging each other and trying to coordinate through Discord and Twitter to this like more automated protocol. Um, so let's maybe talk about kind of an overview of the different parts of the system of party protocol um, and what are the pieces that you had previously composed off of existing tools and what are the pieces that you had to build in-house with this? Yeah, definitely. So the party protocol is essentially consists of like two different phases of um like a like group coordination. The first one is crowdfunding, which remains somewhat similar to how it was in the beginning. Uh, and then the second is the governance, which um, there's a lot of novel and interesting stuff go going on there. So um, and then and then if you want to take one more sub level to the governance, then there's also the ability to kind of like disband and kind of like end the group um, as as well. So if you kind of Think about it from that different life cycle perspective. A party starts with a crowd fund where people basically contribute ETH and then receive proportional voting rights uh, based on the amount of ETH that they contributed. And then that ETH that is being raised can be used to purchase an NFT together. And now with the most recent version of the protocol, you can also raise ETH. And then um, once the crowd fund ends, you can govern that ETH together to do anything with. So you can collect NFTs, but you could also use DeFi. You could play games. You could create a group wallet. You could start a DAO. You could run an open source uh, project. That ETH is basically just governed by by the members. Um, so when you're crowdfunding, you can choose, do I want to raise ETH and just do anything with it? Um, or do I want to raise ETH and do a very specific thing, which is like, uh, which right now is focused on NFT purchasing. So you can choose, do I want to sweep a floor or just buy NFT? And that's the only thing do I want to do? Or do I want to raise ETH and just govern it over time with the people that contribute? And when you participate in a party crowdfund, you immediately receive a membership card. And that membership card is a few different things. That membership card is an NFT. It is transferable. Um, so you could sell it, you could transfer it. Um, it represents your voting rights, so it allows you to vote on decisions within that group. And importantly, it also, from the get-go, immediately when you contribute, you can also choose to delegate your voting rights, which uh, we really lean into um, to our UI because with our first version of the product, as well as our own kind of observations around DAOs, it feels pretty unreasonable to expect every single individual to to be voting. Most people want to delegate their voting rights to somebody else who they trust. So we really lean into that on the front end and have like expansive support for that at, at the protocol level. Um, it 
also represents kind of like your ownership of the assets as well. So if you buy NFT and then you later uh, sell it, you can pass a distribution through a protocol that allows you to claim a proportionate amount of like ERC-20 or ETH from the party that corresponds to your voting power. So if you contributed 50% of the ETH that was used uh, when the party was created, and then you buy NFT and you sell it, and then you distribute the profits, you can receive 50% of those, those profits. And then the membership card is also a dynamic UI that displays your voting power as well as uh, proposals on the um, that are going on on the party itself. So uh, your NFT and your wallet will actually update and give you information about different activity that's going on in the party, as well as tell you if you have any assets to claim from the party as well. Um, so we feel like that's a pretty unique and interesting way to represent voting rights, like uh, ownership, and also be, have like a dynamic UI kind of showing the activity of what's going on in that group. So I want to ask a little bit about the membership card. At first, is that 1155 or something stand, uh, non-standard? It's a 721. It's a 721 because there's two different ways in which you can do your crowdfund. You can choose what we call a membership mint, mint, which means that every membership costs the same amount of money. And that is is kind of like 1155 style, right? Where it's like, okay, every membership co uh, costs 0 0.05 ETH. And then you can reason about them on the secondary market in a very easy way because they're, they all represent the same amount of uh, like ownership and voting power. But you could also choose to do a flexible crowdfund, which allows people to contribute however much uh, they want. And then that would have the NFTs have different amounts of voting power um, and kind of be uh, unique. So when you're configuring your party, you can choose, do I want each membership to cost the same or do I want people to contribute however, however much they want? And there's kind of different use cases for, for either of those two, two approaches. Got it. Yeah, I was going to ask about the, the weighted uh, voting power based on how much money each individual contributor placed in there. So you're saying that the 721 allows you to store that weighting on the token. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think the, there's a lot of different aspects to this that I, I I'd love to dig into. Um, I think the, just the progression that you made from having to build for this particular niche. And I'm sure you had to write a lot of code that was specific to like adding support for specific um, NFT marketplaces to mm -hmm. now that's more generalized, like you have ETH, you can do what you want with it. Can you talk a little bit about the like, that progression, having to sort of like hard code these specific functionalities to then sort of open it up and allow people to do what they want with their ETH? Yeah, absolutely. So for the first version of the party protocol that we released that was still focused um, around NFTs, we were very opinionated about safeguarding our users um, for that particular use case. So for example, we had an explicit proposal type to sell the NFT and we wanted to be able to list it on the most prominent marketplace at the time, which was OpenSea, right? So you could all vote to sell the NFT um, on OpenSea using the Seaport protocol. But we wanted to guard users against somebody getting a majority of the voting power and then trying to list it for a very low price and then selling it to themselves. Um, so we, in the sell on OpenSea proposal, we actually implemented like a safety auction kind of uh, period to try to protect users to ensure that they get the fair market price for their NFT. So instead of just directly listing the NFT on OpenSea, for what could be like too small of an amount, we had this, or we still have this uh, safety auction period, which goes on for 12 hours, which actually lists the item on Zora Auction House with a reserve price of the price that they wanted to sell on OpenSea for. So if you say, hey, I want to list this four to eight for 0 0.01 ETH on OpenSea, there's this safety period where it actually lists it on Zora Auction House first. And then if that price is under market price, that allows anybody who sees on chain that that auction started to bid up that uh, price to be fair market value. So that was like a very explicit protection for the sale of um, an NFT. And that was all kind of hard coded into the, to the protocol. So that's like one example of like a very direct, specific, opinionated 
uh, way of handling NFT selling for that like niche use case um, that we started off with offering. So we had those like hard coded, like specific NFT sale mechanisms, but then we also had the ability to literally do uh, like anything else on Ethereum through like arbitrary bytecode proposals um, as well, as long as they didn't send out the NFT that was like protected um, from the party, which is the NFT that they purchased. So you could claim an airdrop, you could uh, sell an airdrop, you could kind of uh, do a free mint that you're on the allow list for, et cetera, um, through these flexible proposals that were arbitrary bytecode proposals that allow you to specify like a two address and like any arbitrary call data to execute as well. So even though we had like hard-coded protections around like NFT selling and protecting these individual NFTs, we also had this flexible governance system that allowed you to kind of interact with any contract as long as it wasn't removing the NFT that was protected for the party. Um, so that was our first approach with our first release. And then when we kind of open things up to allow people to kind of raise ETH and do anything with that ETH, we really leaned in harder to that arbitrary um, kind of like bytecode execution in making that a really nice experience on our front end. So we allow people to wallet connect into whatever website they want as the party. And then when they trigger a transaction through that wallet connect connection, we show that in the UI. And then we decode the ABI if it's available on Etherscan to show exactly what the function call is, what the parameters are. And then we use some external providers to do a transaction simulation as well to show the um, to show the people who are voting on a proposal what we anticipate that that proposal does. So not just the function name and the parameters, but also a simulation of what might occur when that proposal is executed on chain. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the front end trying to make what could be really scary, kind of arbitrary, uh, executing arbitrary Ethereum bytecode into something that was like digestible, understandable, and trying our best to kind of like safeguard the voters in um, in having confidence in that in that interaction. Um, and then we took it even further in saying that there are some real problems that um, can happen when there's a delay between a proposal being created and a proposal being executed. So when you think about creating a proposal, you generate some proposal to do something on chain, uh, depending on how the party's configured and how active the participants are, there might actually be like a long delay, like on the order of like hours or even days between a proposal executing and a proposal being created. And if you think about the most common actions that people want to do as a group, it's largely like, buying and selling NFTs and buying and selling ERC-20 tokens. And if you created a proposal that was hard-coded, um, like a hard-coded Uniswap trade, for example, um, by the time you go to execute it, the price might have almost definitely will probably have moved since the time that the proposal was created if the participants aren't super active or if it isn't like configured really aggressively, right? So we created our own solution to... Uh, help solve that problem, which we internally call operators um, and which we're releasing for a uh, front end for um, very soon, which I'm excited about. So basically that allows you to kind of specify what I guess now might be considered like an intent, although that's like a very kind of like broad uh, <laughs> term that people are trying to like really kind of like nail down exactly what that means. But essentially it allows you to specify, hey, this proposal is to sell ETH for USDC. Um, and these are the people that can execute that proposal. Um, and you can also specify some guardrails around it, around kind of like, uh, like maximum price movements, but it, it basically allows you to create a proposal then instead of having very explicit arbitrary by code that it will execute, that is, um, generated at the proposal creation time. It allows you the proposal just to kind of specify the intent of wanting to trade ETH for USDC and also setting addresses of, a, of people within the party that you trust to execute that proposal um, once it's accepted. So that allows you to create the trade, pass the trade, and then have the actual execution of the trade use bytecode at the time of execution um, based on the current market uh, prices uh, without getting a revert. Um, so we took that approach for both ERC-20 trading and NFT trading. Um, which we think is a pretty like 
nice novel kind of like innovation for groups in which like prices might change between proposal creation and proposal execution. Yeah, I think those are really good examples of um, designing on the contract side. And in some cases, I guess, it's something like I'll call them intense in quotes because mm -hmm. I feel like that's the most appropriate way to, to reference them for now. Um, like leveraging sort of off-chain infrastructure for, for things that are ultimately going to be on-chain. Um, and, and I think when it comes to consumer applications, providing all of that flexibility and functionality feels really important. Another element here that I think is interesting is when you think about what it looks like to design contracts for flexibility, but also consumer use cases, it seems like you're using a lot of proxy contracts to basically like add features without creating these like massive monolithic, um, you know, sets of contracts that are like impossible for users to actually to to leverage. And so I'm curious more broadly how you think about designing like modular systems. I don't know if you would if you would characterize party protocols as modular in that sense, but I'm curious your approach there. Yeah, so we kind of have um, we have some layers of abstraction, like with different characteristics um, in terms of like their upgradability. So we have like the core kind of like party contract, which controls like the uh, voting um, on different proposals, like the execution of uh, proposals. But we also have this concept of a proposal execution engine, which is what actually like defines what the different proposals are and how they act. So when you create a party, you have this like immutable party contract that you have created, but then you can choose to opt into different proposal execution engines um, if you so, so choose to. So if you want to use if we introduce a new proposal type that you would like to use, then the party can vote on to upgrade to the newest version of the proposal execution engine, which would give you access to that new proposal type. Um, but you are not automatically opted in to do that. That actually is something that has to pass governance. Um, so we have kind of like the core functionality related to like voting, um, like interacting with a proposal execution engine, delegation, et cetera, and this core immutable party contract. And then we have the proposal execution engine, which people can choose to opt in to like the canonical latest, latest version um, through actually passing a proposal. So that has like some really unique benefits, but it also has some challenges as well. Um, thinking about this holistically from like an engineering perspective, it means that the front end team is responsible for basically supporting all versions of these different proposal execution engines, like basically in some format forever. So in some ways, this really rubs on like a challenge in how Web 2 is really different than Web 3 from an engineering perspective, right? For Web 2, it feels like you can just easily push out new code to literally everybody. You can roll it back if it doesn't work. You can move really uh, quickly there. But in the Web 3 world, if you take like the kind of like guarantees for the user seriously with regards to trying to have some sort of like long-term guarantees about what's going to change and how does it change instead of just like upgrading everybody through proxy contracts all the time, you get into this world where you might have parties that are on different versions of proposal execution engines and that have different ABIs that you in good faith want to support for the longevity of however long that party um, is around in, in some format. So that really is like a challenge and somewhat of a burden you take on as a full stack engineering team uh, to support all of these old versions of contracts that might move somewhat quickly. Um, and we could have taken an easier approach where it's like the DAO has control to upgrade everybody at any time and everybody's always on the same latest version. But we kind of took the like decentralized, like self-sovereignty, like ethos pretty seriously. And that we thought we really expect and want people to have strong guarantees about what it means to create a party and what kind of like control that you are guaranteed to have like uh, forever using that party. So we have kind of like very explicit lines between what's upgradable, what's not. And how does the upgrade happen uh, to have people have more confidence um, that their like contracts and their group wallet will like exist for like 
a long period of time, like under the like constraints that they're signing up for when they create the party. Yeah, um, I think that makes a ton of sense. And also managing like 200 like versions of your front end possible combinations sounds like a lot. Um, before we wrap up, I'm, I'm just curious to, to pull on that thread a little bit. Um, I'm curious, are there any contracts that like party DAO can upgrade? And if so, I'm curious how you like made the distinction between what you should be giving users as an option versus what, you know, you as a team or as a DAO or, or whatever you want to call it, um, are, are sort of taking responsibility for. Yeah. So we basically have a set of globals that like the party DAO multi-sig can update. And getting into this like proposal execution engine where like all the different proposals uh, live, uh, we can basically set the address of like what the latest canonical proposal execution engine is. And uh, we set that through our multi-sig and then parties can choose to update their proposal engine to that latest canonical version that we set, or they can choose to stay and chill on their old uh, proposal execution engine. So basically what we're doing is kind of like flagging that there's a new update, giving people like the address of what that new proposal execution engine is, and then giving them, them the optionality to choose to opt into that. That makes a ton of sense. You're sort of like the source of truth in terms of what what's most up to date. Yeah, we're like, this is the latest canonical version. If you want to use it, great. Pass a proposal, upgrade to it. Otherwise, you kind of just have a guarantee that you can hang out on that old version for, you know, as long as you'd like. I like that pattern because it's like uh, immutable by default, but opt-in mutable. Exactly. Yeah, which I think, again, if you really take like decentralization and kind of like self-sovereignty and kind of like strong guarantees around you know, managing, you know, non-trivial amounts of like ETH and like different assets. I think that that's like a important kind of like core, like fundamental thing to, to give to people. Totally. Um, well, Steve, this was such a lovely conversation. I am so glad that we got to dive into your work kind of across the space in both the, the more like deep into the stack on zero X stuff, but also um, on the consumer side of things with all of the, the projects that you've done um, that are more creative endeavors, and then also with Party DAO and Party Protocol. Where can people learn more about you and all of the wonderful work that you're doing in the space? Yeah, you can uh, check out my Twitter. Um, Steve KLBNF is my handle. Um, and then also would really encourage people uh, to check out the Party Protocol. You can do that through using our consumer app at party.app. And then there's also links there to dive more at the protocol level. And then also would encourage anybody who's thinking about any novel use cases, either like from like a smart contract composability side, or even just from a consumer kind of interesting uh, community or DAO or project that could potentially leverage party to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to jam on creative ideas and do what I can to help push this space forward. Beautiful. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate you, Steve. Thank you. It was awesome chatting.